along with that. And uh, so we're uh, going to be focusing and finishing our series on hymns of the faith. And uh, today we're going to look at grace. And uh, you can tell by the songs that we've sang already, it's about grace. And uh, we're also going to use this as a transition to our new series. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But uh, if you're talking about hymns of the faith, and we've gone over several hymns, of the faith, uh, this is by far uh, the most popular. Uh, Amazing Grace is, is sung everywhere. Uh, uh, people that aren't even really uh, church affiliated or Christians uh, would know at least the, the hymn of Amazing Grace, the song, the tune to Amazing Grace if they don't uh, know the song completely. Uh, so if you talk about hymns, this is uh, the, the creme de la creme. This is the big daddy. This is the, uh, the top dog right here and so uh, we're going to finish on that and we're going to finish on it because I think it talks on a subject that is, is vitally important uh, when it comes to the faith and that is grace and so it also tie into our next series uh, but like I said I'll get to that in a minute so if you are on Ephesians 2 8 through 9 can I get an amen, amen. all right we're actually going to read Ephesians 2 8 through 9 but then in a minute we're going to read the whole first uh part of the chapter of 1 through 10 to kind of get the whole context of what Paul is talking about. But Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you would, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for grace. We thank you for the fact that it is amazing, that it is sweet, that it is uh, beyond comprehension sometimes. How an undeserving lot like us, an undeserving group like us can deserve this unmerited and unwarranted favor that you have blessed us with and you have shown us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that you love us and care for us and that you have poured down this grace on us. And we, we love you for that. And we just ask that as we study your word, as we look into your word, may you open up our hearts and our minds. Uh, may you allow us to receive this message and apply it to our lives. Uh, we ask that the Holy Spirit move in a mighty way today where he can give all honor and glory and praise to you. We love you. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. So Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 is kind of the, the nugget of this grace chapter. And so if you memorize scripture, and I encourage you to memorize scripture, this should be on the top of your uh, memorization list. And, and it's important to understand and see it. And, and we know this song because I think the, the weight that it carries, the, the importance of it. Uh, this song was written by John Newton, and the story to John Newton, it kind of goes perfectly with this song. Of course, he wrote it, and obviously it, that would be the case. So, so but the, the idea then is this, this grace here completely and, and totally changed him. Uh, he grew up, and he was discipled by his mother, and his mother was a great uh, Christian influence, and he died, uh, she died at a young age, and so... He went to go to work with his dad. His dad was a, a uh, worked on a ship and was a, a um, you know helped on the ship. And so he went to work with his father. And uh, you know this idea of sailors being a rough group is, is kind of well known, right? You know uh, when it says to talk like a sailor, you, you talk like a sailor. Um, it's not exactly a, a compliment, right? Uh, and the sailors have some salty words, right? Uh, we were talking about this earlier with the group. There's a great SpongeBob episode where SpongeBob hears this bad word, and uh, you know he's like, "How do you know that word?" Crab, this crab, this. But but sailors are a rough group, right? Uh, and they talk coarse and they act coarse. And and uh, John Newton says this. He says about his time being a sailor. He says, "I sinned with a high hand," and he said, "I made it my study to tempt and seduce others." All right. So he had this Christian upbringing. But then he gets caught in this, this, this merchant trade and on these uh, ships. And then he's, he's there and he's living this lifestyle. And he's living in a manner that doesn't exactly honor and glorify God, right? So this wretched sinner am I. You get this idea that he is on these ships and he's doing these things. And so you get a bunch of guys out in the middle of the ocean. And you get them on shore, shore when they come on shore. And, you know, you can just imagine in your mind, not too much because we're in church, but you can imagine in your mind the things that happen, the things that are going on. Um, and they're probably not the best, not God honoring, not Christ honoring. And so we see here that Newton was on these ships. And, in fact, 
Some of these ships we'll learn later on that were these were slave ships that he was on and he was part of. And, and, and in the midst of this, he got saved. In 1747, while reading the book by Thomas Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, um, he served on one of these ships and he read this in the middle of the storm and he was saved. And, and it changed his life. And he went from being, as he said, a sinner with a high hand uh, and study and to tempt and seduce others. He went to use his idea of being on this ship as a way to maybe to help and to encourage others and to kind of bring a light into that dark area. He served on a maid as a, a captain. Uh, he served on these ships and he kind of was there working. Uh, and he used, he was hoping to kind of have his influence to kind of ease back uh, the excesses of this uh, slave trade and these these wicked practices that were going on. And he said of this, he says, that he was hoping to promote the promoting of the life of God in the soul, uh, was what he said about this idea of him being on these ships. Uh, so both on his ship and on the cargo, uh, the slaves that he imported, he was hoping to be a light. And later on in life, he kind of would retire from this. He would leave the slave trade, uh, and he would take kind of like an office job. And in 1755, is when he retired and he would go to lead Bible studies and he would go to to, to, to help people, to minister people. So we see this change in his life to, to where he was actually uh, living out the faith and working the faith. And in fact, in 1764, uh, he was ordained and he took a job at Oldie in, in Buckinghamshire. It's an actual place. I love these names like, you know, Robin of Locksley, right? Buckinghamshire. And, you know, I may have to go to England one day just to kind of see these things. Uh, so here he is, he, he becomes a priest, becomes a pastor, he's ordained for the ministry, and, and it was there that he would begin to write uh, these hymns. He would write them to familiar tunes of the day, uh, and he would have a Thursday night evening service, and, and you know how sometimes midweek services can get, it's kind of a drudge, and it's kind of, uh, you know, maybe a down sometimes, and he would take, and he would challenge his friend to write these hymns. And to write these songs, and he would take them to modern day songs, and he would take the hymn and, and put those to those songs. And one of the songs that he penned, uh, and one of the hymns that he wrote, was Amazing Grace. And I think it's a tad bit ironic, but uh, uh, this idea of worship wars, and, and you know, do we do all contemporary? Do we all do all hymns? Do we do, you know, do, we do a mixture of it? What do we do? Do we have a band? Do we have a guitar? Do we have drums? Do we have a live band? Do we have instruments and, and one of the things is you know they always get up and they're like we want our hymns we want hymns like amazing grace and that seems to be the standard right and we want these classic hymns and i think it's so funny so ironic that amazing grace was actually a bar tune right uh, so Newt took this bar tune that they would play and he put the lyrics to amazing grace on it so in the midst of your arguing about which songs you want you're you're kind of defeating your own argument because Newton understood that. He said, look, we can use any kind of music. Music seems to be kind of neutral, right? It's the lyrics that you put on top of it. So Newton used this bar tune then to reach these people and say, listen to these lyrics. And so it was there that he, as he was ministering, he would write these hymns. And he wrote this and he applied it to this bar tune. And this idea that he then would see that this hymn would go and it would start to gain popularity. Um, in 1787, Newton wrote Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade. And it was in this time, and it was in this ministry that he began to see uh, and, and, and form this idea with William Wilberforce and the abolitionist movement to end slavery in, in England and Europe at that time. Because he had seen the, the, the bad side of it. He would seen the evils and the atrocities that took place. Uh, and he says this, he says, a business at which my heart now shudders. And so he saw how evil and wicked this slave trade was. And it's this idea that this amazing grace uh, took and transformed this rough living sailor, right? That would sell and would move slaves from, from Africa to wherever, right? And it takes him and it changes him and it causes him to be one of the leaders in this abolitionist movement. To be one of those that writes this book to help to spur on this abolitionist movement. So the great thing about grace is that it changes us. The sweet sound of amazing grace is taking a rough 
and tough slave trading sailor living for sin and self-enjoyment and turning him into a pastor that would help to put an end to the slave trade in Europe. See, that's that's what's amazing about grace. And then the, the, the opening lines of his song says, amazing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So we see that this has even more weight when we understand the enormity behind this song, the, the life change behind this song. And that's really what our, our verse today and our, the, the study we're going to start off today is going to look at. And it's this idea of grace. And, and grace is just, not only is it amazing, it's wonderful, and it's awesome, and it's the one thing that really defines our religion. It, it's this idea that uh, grace is the one thing that makes uh, Christianity, true Christianity, different than all other religions in the world. Now, obviously, I don't mean to discount Christ and what he did on the cross. So that's part of it. But this grace is that teaching from that. And if you would, we're Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But we're going to kind of expand that now. We're going to look at the whole first part of Ephesians 2. And Paul here is kind of giving his discourse or giving his, his lessons on grace. And uh, it says this, Ephesians 2, we'll start at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were nature by children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So Paul's setting up here, right? We live this one way, kind of like Newton, right? We live this way on our slave ships and and our trades and, and, and idea of being in sin. So he sets up that we were dead in our trespasses. And he says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated, with, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we see this whole teaching idea here of Paul talking about this idea of grace. And so what we're doing is we're going to actually use this idea of grace as a transition into our next study. In our next study, we're going to look at the, the five solas of the Reformation. Reformation. Now, on October 31st was the 500-year celebration of the Reformation. I'm trying to get to that in my notes. Hold on. Uh, skipped over. I hate when I do that. All right, yeah, October 31st, 1517, is when Martin Luther famously nailed his 95 Thesis to the church at Wittenberg. Uh, and so what this was, was, was Luther uh, was a practicing Catholic at this time. And, and really what the Re Reformation is, is the splitting of uh, the, the Protestants out of the Catholic Church. And, and Luther didn't really want to split the church. He wasn't uh, about that. He was uh, worried about what Catholicism at that time was doing and, and what he was, uh, what they what he saw doing, the selling of indulgences, the buying people out of purgatory, the, the selling of Peter's bones and, and selling and literally buying people into heaven. And so he saw these things and he saw that these things weren't really right. So he posted these 95 theses or 95 questions on the door of the church at Wittenberg. And, and 500 years later, it kind of defines who we are as Protestants and who we are as, as uh, a Baptist. And a lot of that stemmed from that. So we're going to look at these five solas. So out of love and concern for the truth, uh, Luther wanted to, to reform. That's where you get the word reformation, right? 
He wanted to change the church. He wanted to re reform the church. And so he brings up these questions. Let's talk about these 95 things. Let's talk about these 95 questions I have. And let's bring about this change. And so we see here there's five things that come out of these 95 questions or out of this reformation as a whole. Sola Scriptura by Scripture alone or only. Sola de Gloria uh, by glory to God alone. Uh, sola uh, gratia by grace alone, sola fi by faith alone, and sola Christus uh, through Christ alone. So we see that these are essentially the five core principles of not only Reformation, but as uh, Protestants and, and Christians moving forward. So we see here that we're going to tie this idea of grace, this amazing grace, into this sola gratia, grace alone. And so Luther here wanted to kind of reform the church. He says that this idea that we need to take this, uh, this religion, we need to take uh, Catholicism, and we need to bring it back to this idea of the back to what it is essentially about. And it is about grace. It is about these five things. And so if we don't remember the past, is the old saying right, what? That we are to condemn to repeat it. If we don't remember what happened in the past, we are condemned to relive it over and over and over again. See, there was a time when people literally fought and died to have freedom of worship. Uh, if we remember our history books, Catholicism at uh, this time was major. And basically, it was everywhere. It was the Roman Catholic Church. It was the uh, Roman city. I mean, if you think of Rome, you think of history, you think of Rome. You think of them ruling a large section of the world. And so when things tend to get big like that, they tend to get bureaucratic. And they tend to have systems and, and they have things that they want to do and people they want to please. And, and a lot of times when you're big like that, you kind of forget your first love, as the Bible calls it. Uh, you kind of forget why you started. And that's the important things about coming back to the basics. And and we even see that a little bit in our day and age today, right? Uh, we see that our government has gotten so big and so bloated, and it's for a special interest or it's for lifelong politicians. We forget that it's a government, what, by the people and for the people, right? We talk about gun control rights or, or you know, birth rights or gay rights or whatever, that, that it's us, it's the people that give the rights to the government to do certain things. We forget that it's... It's us that are empowering them. They have a picture of Catholicism at this time, right? And that's why the founders and that's why people coming over here were so determined to have this separation of church and state, the separation of religion. Nowadays, we often get it confused and we think that it's to keep religion out of the government. But what it really was, it was to keep government out of religion and to protect religion. You even see back after the Reformation, uh, the, the church splits, you have Catholicism, you have the Protestants splitting from the church, uh, from Catholicism, and then you see that the Protestants go and they do exactly what they didn't like the Catholics doing when they set up the Church of England, or they set up the churches in Germany, that they set up the same exact things. And so we have to be careful that we go back to what is original, back to what we see from Scripture. And so Luther wanted to reform the church, out of love and concern for the truth and for the church, he wanted to start a conversation. He wanted to start these ninety-five talks, if you would, about these five core things. And so he wants to start this uh, at his church. He's the pastor there. He's the, you know, the he's uh, teaching at the school. And so we see here that the thing about grace and the thing about grace that makes it amazing and awesome. And we see that other than any other religion in the world, that grace defines Christianity. See, all other religions, including Catholicism, are works-based religion. You have five steps to get through, five pillars of Islam. In Catholicism, you have the, uh, the last rites, you have uh, you know, uh, the, the baptism, you have these steps that you have to perform. The, you have these things that you have to perform. And when Luther saw this, he said, look, it's about grace. We are saved by grace through faith, is what Paul says. 
And what does he say? Not by works, lest any man should boast. See, in religion, it says you have to do A, B, and C to get to God. Grace says you don't have to do anything, but I am the one through the cross and through Christ came down to you. It's a major shift in how we think of reaching God. We are no longer reaching up to God, but God is reaching down to us. So when Luther challenges the authority, when Luther challenges the rulers of his day, um, as you would expect, things don't go exactly well, right? When you challenge people's power, when you challenge people's authority, and you would challenge their basis of what they draw that power and authority off of, things don't really go well. And so he's challenged with this, and he, he is brought in front of the church, and he's accused, he's asked to recant of what he says. And I love what he says here. He's, faced, uh, he's facing this trial, and he's facing banishment from the church. He's even facing death. I mean, we can't really imagine that in our day and age to where, you know, if I were to write books and I were to say certain things, I could be brought up in front of, you know, the elders and Nate and, and Greg and Joe to be like, look, we're can't, we're going to kill you. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we can't even imagine that in our day. I can imagine maybe Nate doing that. But, um, you know, we can't even imagine that. But here he is, right? And he says, look, you have to, you, you're starting something here. And, and, and I know you maybe you didn't mean to do this, but look, this is building. You have to recant. And I love his answer. He says, Less, therefore, I'm convinced by the testimony of Scripture, right? We're bringing back to Scripture. We're bringing back to these things. Or by the clearest reasoning, unless I'm persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, Scripture again, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the Word of God, I cannot and will not retract. For it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. See, what Luther was saying is, look, I know we're part of this big, huge, uh, you know, bureaucratic monster, but we've lost our foundation. We've lost our faith. He said there are these things that we need to get back to. There are these things that we have to get back to. And for us, it starts with grace. See, amazing grace is amazing, and it's sweet, and it's awesome because it is God coming down, reaching down, pouring down to us. And, and, and all other religions, all other belief systems are us working our way to God. In ancient Greeks, they had this, this idea or this teaching that they would place coins on either the eyes or I think the, the story goes that they would put it in the mouth of the deceased person. And this coin would be used to pay uh, Charon, which was the ferryman of the dead, to passage them across the river Styx. And the river Styx is what divided the living from the dead. And they would take this coin, and that would be their passage. So you could take and say, literally, I want this person to go from the living to the dead. And, and, and so we see that even the Greeks had this idea that you could either work or pay, or buy your way into salvation. You could buy your way into this idea of being with the, the dead. And if you didn't put a coin on there, then they would wander around for a thousand years aimlessly. <coughs> See, works and all other religions say you must do A, B, C, and D. You must do one, two, three, four, five. Or you must do dot, dot, dot to get to heaven. See, grace is beautiful. Grace is awesome. Grace says no, no. I am going to provide the path for you. See, there is a coin. There's this idea of this two-sided coin when it comes to faith. The first side, which we're going to look at, is grace. And next week, we'll look at the other side, which is faith. And they work together to provide salvation. So we don't believe that there are, are earn your way. We don't believe that you work your way to heaven. We believe that God has provided. So let's look at the three P's of grace. Today, we're going to look at sola Grasha, or grace alone, that you are saved by grace through faith. So by grace, and then the other side of it is through faith. See, faith is the means, but grace is the way that you are saved. And so we see that you are saved by grace through faith. First thing we see in this verse in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, is the past, right? So for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. 
This is not for yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, faith is the means in which you are saved, but grace is how you are saved. And Paul says, look, we all know that we used to live in this old manner, this unworthy manner. We see the past here, and you were dead in the trespasses of sin, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit is now at work, and the sun's of disobedience. So we see here that he's listing these things, and among whom all once lived, not some, but all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. H.L. Williamson lists several things here about the past or the way that we used to live. He said that we were dead in sin. He said that we were influenced by Satan. We were controlled by lust. We are under God's wrath. We are pagans without a God. We are separated from Christ and without hope in this present world. So we see this past. And if we see this and we understand this, that dead things don't do anything, right? Now, unless you're in this walking dead world, right, which apparently they get out and they walk around, uh, and it's not too fun looking because they're kind of gross and nasty, right? But look, last time I checked, dead things don't do anything. Right? If you're dead, you're dead. And so you can't be workspace. You can't do certain things because God says, look, you were once, and, and when you're not saved by grace through faith, and you are dead in your trespasses and sin. It's not that you can accomplish anything because you're dead. He says this past that we once lived in defined us before we had grace, before we came to the cross. See, you were dead in your trespasses. Not only that, but you were following the course of Satan, that you were following another master. See, we are led by something other than God. We are dead in our trespasses. And we all lived according to certain things that we wanted to. Our passion, our flesh, our desires, and our mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. See, we all tend to think that our state is good, right? That, that we're all just good people, that, that we're born good, that we're born, uh, and, and if we continue to live a good life, and if we continue to do good and right things, then good and right things will happen, and, and if we die, then, you know, we've been good people, and we'll make it to heaven. But see, that's not the story at all. See, the story is that we are born in our trespasses, that we are all sinful people, that we've all done terrible and sinful thing. Now look, maybe some of you are worse, uh, and some of us are better. Uh, maybe some of us don't do other things, and we look at them and go, I can't believe they do that, right? But God says, look, we are all children of wrath. We all belong on the past side. Look, I love my children, right? And I have six little test tubes that I test things in, right? Um, and look, my kids, I wish they were angels, and I wish that they all they did was get along, right? But they don't, you know, and if you take, let's say you take six kids and you put them in a room with a bunch of toys, what do you think eventually is going to happen in that room? They're not going to devise up a plan in which they share toys evenly, do you think? No, it's going to be fighting. It's going to be, this is my toy. This is, this is what I want. This is how I am. Now we teach hate and we teach evil and we teach our biases and our bigotries and we hand a lot of things down. There are a lot of things in us, the selfishness. This idea that, that we have this selfish and this sinful nature within us. And Paul says, look, we are defined by our past. See, the great thing about grace is that it takes that past and it throws it completely away. And I love this idea where Paul talks here. He says, but God. I mean, this is one of those beautiful pictures of Scripture here. So you take everything that he was just mentioning fact that we're lived by uh, desires, that we fulfill our lust, that we have all these things that we live by, that we're dead in our trespasses, that we have this past behind us, and this past is what defines us, and it's who we are, but God. See, that changes everything. It takes out all that we were before, and it completely takes it and wipes it away. See, it is God that provides this grace. It is God who is the provider of our salvation. See, Luther looked at the church and he saw that you could buy, you could literally buy your way into heaven. That you could go to the city and you could 
purchase and each prayer with your step, you could pay so much and you could get people out of purgatory or, or you can put them straight into hell or straight into heaven out of hell. And you can literally do things. And, and Luther looks and he reads verses like this and he goes, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not the church that is the provider of salvation. It is God that provides the salvation. See, we are saved by grace through faith, not of your own self, not of your works, lest any man should boast. See, it's not about what we do. It's not about the prayers we say. It's not about who we go or where we go on Sundays or which church we go to. It's about God, but God. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, uh, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ. This is a beautiful picture, right? Because he loves us, because he cares about us, because of his great love which he loved us, because of this grace that he pours down to us, he takes the stiff an old rugged and dead man with coins on his eyes to hopefully can carry over the river sticks or with the you know, cartoon when you're dead and you got the little X's on your eyes and your mouth, right? And you're dead and you're stiff and you're in rigor mortis and you're in the tank, you're in the tomb, and you're in the grave. You're dead. But he says, because God loves us, but God, he takes us and he makes us alive together with Christ. So we see the past and this picture of grace. We see the provider of this picture of grace. And what Luther says here is he says, look, it's not the church that provides salvation. It's God that, survive, that provides salvation. It's sola gratia, through grace alone, through nothing else but grace and faith, the flip side of the coin, which we'll look at next week. So it's by grace that you've been saved alone. So it's, it's the past that is wiped away. It is God, the provider of that grace. But then he goes and he says, look, but you're not just saved to be saved. And I love how Paul ends this verse here. He says there is a purpose of your salvation, right? He says there's a past that you have that God wipes away. But God, the provider of the salvation for God being rich in mercy and love, provided the salvation, takes us from dead to life. He takes us from, from all of our dead sins and all the things in the past that makes us new. But he says, but then there's a purpose to the salvation. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works. See, this idea that we are all, look around each and every one of us, and we can look at each other and go, look, I am Pinocchio. Right? You are this nice wooden little boy. You were created by God. You are a workman of God. You are this toy of God that he has created you, and he's molded you, and he's made you for a reason. And he says that in Christ Jesus, you were made to do good works. See, our past was forgotten. It was provided for by God, not for us to just sit in and just soak it in. See, one of the things Luther struggled with with the Catholic churches is, is that the Catholic Mass in that time was spoken in Latin, and nobody really knew Latin. And, and, and they didn't provide Bibles. In fact, if you wanted to know about the Bible, you either had to go to a school like he did, and be learned and instructed in it, or you would go to the priest. And there was no way to verify it. So what Luther wanted to do, seeing that these five pillars, seeing sola scriptura, right, that scripture alone provides salvation, he wanted to provide people with Bibles and translate Bibles. In fact, he did uh, in one of the first German translations of the Bible. And he saw that the people had to understand scripture for us to understand what it meant. And so we turn to scripture, we turn to God, we turn to grace alone. And if God says, look, I created you, and I made you to have no strings on you, right? See, there are no strings on me, little Pinocchio, right? I'm free to do what I want because of past being done away with, provided being done away with, but I want you to do good works. We are, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, before you get too high and mighty on your good works, right, and you start to, you know, brush off your shoulders, start to pat yourself on the back and say, look, I do all these great things, right? I've done A, B, and C, and so it's clearly, clearly God loves me, right? Because I've done this, or clearly I'm blessed because I have this. God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Those good things that you've even done, 
It says, which God prepared beforehand. Are you kidding me? Right? Look, even the good things we've done, God says, yeah, look, I got that too. Right? Because it's all about God, right? It's all about Christ. It's all about his glory. So that the glory, it's a glory to God alone. It's not about you and me and what we do. It's not about building up the steeples and filling this room and doing all other things. We are created by God to do good works to give him glory. Because he's the one that even created and set up those good works. See, that's the three P's of grace. That's the purpose of grace. It's for us to come into this relationship. Our past is wiped away. God provides this relationship for us. He reaches down to us. He takes us out of the muck and the mire and forms us into this beautiful little wooden boy. And he allows us to go on and create and do these good works to bring honor and glory to him. And so Paul sees this and he writes this great chapter here. And Luther saw this and wrote these the, the 95 questions of why are we not as a body of believers doing these things? Why are we relying on the testimony of, of one man? Why is there not this, this freedom to interact with scripture and interact with God? The mediator, the only mediator is Christ Jesus and we have direct access to him. We don't have to go to these priests. You don't have to buy people's way into heaven. You don't have to go and serve in purgatory. There's no such thing as purgatory. There's the idea that these things, all these things that they were building up together, he says, look, we need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to these five core truths. And we're going to spend the next four weeks here looking at these five solas. But see, for me, it starts with sola gratia. It starts with grace alone. See, grace is amazing. And grace is a sweet and wonderful sound. It takes a wretch like you and me that once was blind but now can see. And we see what we're here for. We see why we are living and what we are doing to do good works in Christ's name to give him honor and glory. If you would, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the fact that 500 years ago you spoke to Martin Luther, that you called him to reform or to change the church. We thank you for the things and the way that it lined up. We thank you for the fact that we are focused on what we need to be focused on, these five core principles of faith. We thank you for the fact that we are not caught up in these all other peripheral things. May we be a church that focuses on the core essentials. May we use connect, may we use cultivate, may we use community to reach out and to talk to people, to share people, to give you all <laughs> honor and glory and praise. We thank you for the fact that we are saved by grace through faith. We thank you for the fact that I don't have to earn my salvation. That I don't have to do certain things to be saved because I know, as the song says, that I am a wretched sinner. That I will fall and stumble and mess up. And it was up to me to save myself and I know that I would fail. But it's not. It's up to you and by grace that you've poured down on us, that you've reached down into this dark world, that you've given this light into this world, and you've shown us that you have saved us by your power, that you are the provider of this salvation, that you are the one that gives the provisions, that you are the one that, that gives us the power, the ability to do it, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that you loved us enough before we even knew you, that we were dead in our trespasses, that we didn't even think about you, couldn't even realize you who you were or what you were, that you reached down and loved us enough to provide a way for us, that you provided the cross and the blood of Christ to cover our sins, and we thank you for that. We love you, and we ask all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'll be down front if you have any questions about Connect Church or about the sermon. Before you go, hold on, uh, we have been uh, singing a song to close. And in the service, and I kind of like that, so we're going to kind of continue that.